Good evening. It's difficult to introduce someone who is a, a great person as Diona Neutra. She met Richard Neutra as a very young woman in her late teens and shared his life, uh, struggles and triumphs as he went on to become one of our greatest modern architects. The last few years, she has developed to further developing her, her music and her voice and has spent time traveling throughout the United States and Europe concertizing and has been very interested in what we've been doing at SciArc, has been very supportive of the school since its inception. She's been a great friend to all of us. Some of you have met her when I've taken field trips to see the Richard Neutra work and the rest of her, the rest of you, I'm delighted to introduce you to tonight. It's a great pleasure to have with us Diona Neutra. second. <laughs> when I received the invitation to address you, I tried to think what might interest you. In the course of your studies, you will no doubt hear about Richard Neutra's work, see slides, or perhaps some of his buildings. What you probably will not learn and that applies to all the architects whose output you are studying, is what kind of a human being this architect was, and how many trials and tribulations he had to endure until he reached a position where a student of architecture would hear about him. You also face difficult times, may often feel discouraged or apprehensive, I thought it might comforting to hear, for you to hear about a young man who struggled, never lost faith in his own abilities, and finally succeeded. Perhaps the most logical way to start is to read to you the introduction to my biography, which is based on a 50-year-old correspondence between my husband and myself. For the time being, it is called The Shaping of an Architect. As I am by training and predilection a musician, I thought you might enjoy a short musical interlude. Unfortunately, you have no piano, so I will have to content myself with singing and accompanying myself on the cello. And by the way, as far as I know, I'm the only person in the world who can sing and play the cello at the same time. At first, I forgot to breathe, then I forgot to move the bow, but now I've done it for a long time. By the way, if I had known the color scheme of your platform, I probably would not have put on a green dress. I will start with a song from Piedmont. Piedmont is a province in Italy, and the people there speak a very funny uh, dialect, which is a cross between Italian and French, because the Bourbons were there for a long time. Torino is the capital of Piedmont. Do you know what has happened to me today? I have lost my husband. And do you know how big he was? as big as my little finger. I hunted everywhere for him, and finally I found him hiding under a leaf in the garden. The poor dear was shivering. So I dressed him up beautifully. I pressed him to my heart to warm him up. And after I had done all that, the ants ate him up. <laughs> Grande, 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 grande,
written before the French Revolution while the uh, French nobility was playing being shepherd and shepherdess. Lison was sleeping in the forest. She was lying on a bed of green moss. What a lovely place to be. Her lover came by to wake her up. He pulled her tresses. She didn't wake up. He put flowers over her. She still didn't wake up. Finally, he thought, maybe if I would kiss her, she would wake up. And he tried it. It did the trick. She did wake up. Lise, Yeah? 
Now I will sing you a Swiss song. I, I grew up in Switzerland, and this is a song uh, how the herdsmen call their cows in the mountains. First they call the black and white ones, and then they call the patterned ones. <laughs> As I mentioned, I'm going to start with the introduction of my book. I call it the why and the how. Before I explain why I wrote this book or how I composed it, a few explanatory sentences. In the last three decades of Neutra's life, he did a lot of traveling. He was invited to lecture not only at big universities, but also at small colleges in USA, Europe, South America, Asia, and Africa. I accompanied him as his secretary and buffer between the exigencies of travel and other annoyances. After we had been received at the airport by a delegation from the university, we were put into a car and whisked towards the hotel. Neutra would put this question, why did you invite me? Why did you spend so much money not only for my lecture fee but also for first class fare for my wife and myself? What do you expect from me? What do you know about me? What do I stand for? Have you read or seen any of the 10 books I've written? How would you characterize the difference between myself and, for instance, Le Corbusier, Gropius, or Mies van der Rohe? These were the three giants of what used to be called modern architecture, and Neutra's name was often linked with theirs in various publications as one who had contributed to the development of modern architecture. He was always surprised and puzzled how little was known about him and how vague these professors were and incapable to clearly define what Neutra believed his contribution to be. When he so suddenly and unexpectedly died in April 1970 during a lecture trip in Europe, I received about 700 telegrams and letters of condolence from all parts of the world. Many of the letters were long and tried to express the feelings of the writers and what they felt Richard Neutra's influence had been on 20th century architecture. The best letter was written by an architect in Germany. And as it expresses so well what he thought Neutra stood for, I want to quote from it. Richard Neutra chose to serve life. This seems to be a simple statement, but it has much content. Life has its own laws, duration, diversity, multiplicity, and also an unending tenaciousness. To serve life means that every living thing, animal and plant, must be preserved and must be given its central place. Richard Neutra's buildings are a true oasis in our time, filled with plants and water, the basis of life. 
in a period during which so many phases of our human activity become bigger and bigger and smother us through their inner emptiness, he is the only one of the great architects who recognized the frontiers of architecture and the partnership of space with the surrounding nature, a concept he introduced into the Western Hemisphere. His is an architecture which recognized quite consciously that our natural environment must be better understood. And this is something new in the history of architecture as we know it. The Japanese accomplished it quite unconsciously with their plans and gardens." Unquote. Footnote. The writer of this letter apparently was not aware of the important contribution made by Frank Lloyd Wright. However, neither he nor the Japanese had tackled the problem that, quote, our natural environment must be better understood with the scientific knowledge Neutra had acquired by studying the literature and researches of human biologists or brain physiologists and applying this knowledge to his design decisions. Unquote. End of footnote. Beginning of letter. Then around the year 800 before Christ, Western man rose above his clans. He left nature and more and more turned his back to it. The more he achieved perfection in his technique, the farther he removed himself from nature. What is now happening is man's return to nature after going astray for so long a period of time. It is a return to long forgotten shores, full of emotion and deep remorse. Remorse for those who take the visual effect of modern architecture in combination with nature as an ultimate truth without recognizing the deeper meaning. Deep remorse for those who have recognized that technique and perfection without wisdom spell the end of the human race. To know that means to be cognizant that we left modern nature many thousands of years ago, that we are now about to recognize nature's full meaning, that we have reached a new level of apperception. How can we better express it in words than Richard Neutra has done with his buildings? As stated above, Life has its own laws. There is an up, a down, a breathing in, a breathing out. But let patience be the keynote. The seeds Richard Neutra sowed will eventually sprout forth a hundredfold." Unquote. Many of the writers at that time and many more people since have asked me, are you writing a biography about your life? When are you writing it? You definitely should because otherwise so much would be lost and you are the only one who knows. How to tackle such a biography kept me worried for several months until I remembered the box of old correspondence I had stored in the basement when we moved into the VDL research house in 1933. What could be in that box was my thought. Imagine my delighted surprise to find neatly bundled per year all the letters I had written to my future husband starting as a 19-year-old girl. Neuter's own letters I had always carefully preserved as one of my greatest treasures. When I read these old letters, after an interval of half a century, I was struck not only by their philosophical content, but also by the realization how well they portrayed in the development of two young people who eventually married and influenced each other. Miraculously, they also retained their own individuality helped each other, and remained dev devoted for 48 years. Perhaps some quotes from an article I was asked to write for the AIA journal in September 1957 with the title, How a Wife Can Help Her Husband Become a Good Architect, unquote, explains why the idea came to me to base this book on our exchange of letters. I quote the following excerpts. <coughs> I have been asked to write down my thoughts regarding the role the wife of an architect can play in her husband's life. Having been married for 34 years, I may perhaps be considered to have some ideas on the subject. Let me start from the very beginning. I was 18, the oldest of four daughters living in Zurich, Switzerland, studying cello and voice. Richard Neutra had been an officer in the Austrian army. He had managed to escape the drab, hopeless atmosphere of a defeated country, and although he was not able to find work as an architect in Zurich, 
did the next best thing, he worked for the best landscape architect, earning just enough to pay his room and board. It took only a few weeks before all my sisters, our girlfriends, and myself included, were hopelessly in love with this young man who was so different from the Swiss. We met in April, and by September my mother thought it was high time to put distance between us, as this young man had no job, no money, apparently no prospects to be a suitable husband for their talented daughter. So I was sent to Vienna to continue the study of cello and imbibe the cultural and musical atmosphere of that city. What she did not know was that the die had been cast already, and although no word of marriage had been spoken, I was willing to wait 10 years if necessary until that was possible. Now started the correspondence where I was slowly initiated in all the ideas, hopes, expectations, convictions my hero had at that time. Recently we read together a letter I then wrote him in which I outlined what kind of a wife I thought he would need. We were amazed how well I had guessed so long ago. I realized then dimly that I had met an, an unusual human being one with high aspirations, and I felt I would like to help him realize these aspirations. I felt he needed someone who would be a good listener, not conventional, ready to pull up stakes and go wherever he wanted to go. I resolved that he would always be more important to me than my children, as I had seen too many marriages where husband and wife had lost their initial closeness and were hopelessly separated in spirit and understanding by the time their children had grown up and they were again alone together, yet we both love our three boys. I felt it was wonderful to be permitted to share and slowly learn to understand my young man's thoughts and ambitions. Our correspondence lasted for four years, and I'm ever grateful for this long and slow initiation and gradual understanding of my future husband's mind. For many years, I was the only secretary typing specifications for the few jobs we had and the books he wrote. All the time my husband was able to make me more and more enthusiastic toward his approach to architecture and the way he talked to his clients. Although he started without money, without connections, advocating a type of architecture that had hardly any precedent at that time, he slowly built up his reputation and his practice by making people happier. It is not within the scope of this article to write a story of his life as an architect or our life as a family. But I was asked how a wife could help her architect husband. I think that any girl in love would like to help her chosen one to achieve his aspirations, especially if this ambition is to make a better world and not only to become rich and influential. There must be enough idealism and enthusiasm in the young man to make it worthwhile for the girl to forego all sorts of amenities to expect and understand why he is late for meals, why he cannot come along to a dance, concert, party, dinner, picnic. It will take some doing on the young man's part to lovingly explain his needs, and she will be proud and happy to have helped him towards his goal." Unquote. What was his goal? His goal was to create an environment that would not assault but assuage the sensory equipment of his clients. Now to the why. Why should I write this book? Who would be interested to read it? I remember the hundreds of young architects and students who visited us at the VDL Research House in Los Angeles facing Silver Lake, where we lived and worked for 30 years before it was consumed by fire in 1963. I also remember the thousands of students and young architects who crowded around my husband after a lecture in USA, Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America. The following incidents may perhaps illustrate best why they felt that here was a man who had overcome all initial difficulties, had stood by his guns, and had finally received recognition for it during his lifetime. In 1944, Neutra was invited by the USA State Department to lecture in Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, Bolivia, and Peru. In the hotel in Lima, a delegation of students pleaded with him to help them. The leader exclaimed, quote, everything here is steeped in colonialism. 
None of our teachers teach us anything about the new architectural trends in the world. Can you not help us? Unquote. The excellent interpreter for this lecture was architect Belaunde Terry, who much later became president of Peru. Neutra started his lecture thus, and I quote from memory, when I came to Lima, I expected to find a medieval city. I was very surprised to find a Renaissance city instead. Upon inquiry, I learned that you had a huge earthquake in the 17th century which destroyed your capital. Instead of rebuilding it in medieval style, your forebears were forward-looking men who rebuilt it in the new style of the day. I would hope that the architects of Peru would follow in the footsteps of their ancestors." Unquote. A storm of applause interrupted his speech, and we were told later that this remark was used by the students as the wedge that pried open the door to progressive ideas. In all these lectures, Neutra tried to inform himself beforehand what the local difficulties were his colleagues had to contend with and how he could help them to achieve their goals. With his sense of humor, he was able to sugarcoat a bitter pill, thus placating the ad adversaries. His prestige was often helpful. Some architects no doubt felt envy when they heard him and later read an interview in their local paper about this successful American practitioner. However, how little did they or architects all over the world have an inkling of how difficult Neutra's start had been, how many decades of frustrating struggles he had to live through in order to achieve such recognition that he was invited to lecture in so many faraway places. Would they not be interested to know what kind of a human being this architect was, whom they admired and whose books they bought and perhaps read? And what better way was there to demonstrate this than his own letters and my response to them? And now comes the how. How did I go about it? First, I read the original handwritten German letters. Wherever I found a passage that seemed interesting, not only to me but to a general audience, I made a red line and my secretary typed these passages. For four years, I worked on a, bi on a biography of our life together with chapters about Neutra's evolving career forming a part of this personal account. As there were not too many letters dealing directly with his career, I had my secretary retype all the passages and quotes that were intermingled throughout our personal correspondence and reflected his ideas on art, architecture, career, and philosophical contemplation. I then used them in these chapters. Then I read my own letters, tried to find either the answers to Neutra's letters or my questions to him which he had answered. Thus, his evolving career is not only mirrored in his own words, his letters to me, but also in his letters to my mother, called Mütterli, little mother in Swiss language. He had a great admiration and love for her, which is very apparent in their correspondence. These letters, these quotes from letters, have not been tampered with. Nothing has been added or changed. The only liberty I took was to eliminate sentences that refer to intimate personal recollections, too fervent and loving sentences or words so essential and important to young lovers, but embarrassing and irrelevant to the present reader who is interested in Neutra's evolving career and what he thought about art, architecture, and life. Upon the advice of an experienced friend, I have taken these chapters out of my personal biography, and they have been revamped to form the basis of the present book. I also realize that probably nobody but myself would be able to translate these German original letters as well as I could, or understand the meaning behind many of the intricate and long sentences that often baffled even me, who for so many decades was and remained a fascinated listener. I tried to reproduce the unorthodox way he expressed himself in German also in the English translation. To combine all these letters, all these bits and pieces cut out from our correspondence was like fitting a jigsaw puzzle together. It was a fascinating and rewarding task to then write a connecting text that would unite it all into a flowing composition. As a time span of 50 be years between the young Dione then and the Dione who is the present biographer, 
made it possible to view these early years dispassionately, I decided to write the text in the third person. I thus speak of Neutra, of Dione, of my mother Mütterli, and of myself as a biographer. I hope I was able to give the reader a glimpse and an understanding of what kind of a human being Richard Neutra was. This, however, of course, becomes much more apparent in the personal biography of our evolving relationship through five decades. The first volume, The Exchange of Letters from 1920 to 1932, ends in a somewhat hopeful vein with the design of Neutra's own combination office and residence. The years of frustration and struggle seem to have come to an end. How Neutra finally did succeed will be told in the second volume, after I have completed the first volume of our personal biography covering the same period of years, 1919 to 1932. His evolving career from 1932 to his death in 1970 will be illuminated through my diary notes, letters to my family, and descriptions of our world travels. It will again be a very personal account of a very busy and in the later years a very successful life. I hope that this introduction clear, clearly conveyed what this book is all about. I shall start my reading with a page from a diary I found after Neutra's death. It was written in 1916. I start to write down my thoughts. My first feeling is I am nothing. I have not achieved anything. I also did not ask anything more of myself that goes beyond the ambition of a schoolboy. I already have missed something when I realize that I, that I am 25 years old, of which there cannot be any doubt. However, my intellect, when I apply it earnestly, corrects this emotion right away. The circumstances made it impossible to have success. I cannot blame myself for it. If I had not had any success, have I missed out on happiness? No. This is a short enough answer. I am content and usually was so. This contentment occasionally changed to happiness, quite often really. Today I notice clearly that I, I, do, I do not long for this feeling of happiness. It would only distract me because I just realize that I have a suspicious thought that has plagued me for quite a while. With no effort at all, I reject the, uh, the pretext. Perhaps you are chagrined that your wonderful youth is over? No. Also, in reality, something inexhaustible has been left to me. I also am not sad that my beautiful life has been shortened by 25 years. Even if one would patch on 25 years to my existing ones, I would not lessen my melancholy mood at all. If one would make me a gift of 150 years, it would frighten me. What could be the reason for my melancholy? Today it became clear to me that neither happiness nor gratification are the goal of human existence. In case this last statement were indeed true, then the whole meaning of life, what it is all about and what its worth is, seems to, seems to be in question. We race towards an understanding, a relationship to life, the better we succeed without any mishap, the happier we are. However, how often we may succeed, how penetrating our understanding may be, how influential we may be in it or above it, we are not the world itself. We cannot identify with it. All of us remain, I remain solitary, locked out, even if millions of us try to ingratiate ourselves to each other. Emerging with the world is impossible, just as impossible as emerging with our beloved is, who is its symbol. The relationship changes, becomes broader, diminishes, improves or deteriorates in time. This becomes our destiny, our life record. Finally, I recognize quite clearly that just this expectation-filled relationship to the world will characteristically mark my disgrace my solitude, my individuality." Unquote. As I mentioned in my introduction, 
How many of those present here are aware or have any knowledge? How many difficult and frustrating years Neutra had to endure? Not only before he finally could get to America, but also until he finally was able to find clients here. He was an artillery officer during the First World War, and only in 1919 was he able to leave war-ravaged Austria and come to peaceful Switzerland. He tried to find work in Zurich, which proved an impossible task. How he felt at that time, he expressed in another diary book. Zurich, April 28, 1919. I languidly wander about without a goal, exhausted. No work, no money, no home, and no resting place. Oh, dear God, sometimes in my desperation, the thought comes to me that after all, my life was not in danger as it was at other times. Just wait. But if everything is used up already now at the beginning, wait for what? Or a few weeks later, I suffer all the agony of a senseless lost wanderer with empty pockets, torn shoe soles, a beginner who cannot find the beginning. This morning I went to Zurich and crossed the stream of commuters during a heavy snowstorm. Arriving from the left bank of Lake Zurich, they all pour into the city and disperse in their various places of employment. I am certain that not one of them has such ragged shoes and wet feet at this early morning hour. I stare into the volley of snowflakes. Is it not absurd that a diligent young person cannot find work while the whole world is in need of work? Housing shortage and slumbering construction offices, how can it be explained? In 1911, Neutra had discovered the marvelous publication of Frank Lloyd Wright's work, published by Wasmuth in Berlin and financed by himself. It broke like a bombshell into all European architectural offices, and Neutra's greatest wish and determ determination ever since had been to get to the United States and meet this great man and see his work. However, the First World War prevented him for 12 years to realize this wish. Already in the summer of 1919, he wrote a letter to his friend Rudolf Schindler, a student of Otto Wagner, the famous European counterpart of Louis H. Sullivan, whom he met at the evening seminars of Adolf Loos, another pioneer of the modern movement. Schindler had immigrated to USA in 1914, just before the outbreak of the First World War. Neutra wrote, Dear Mr. Schindler, whatever you are reading about it, you cannot have any conception concerning this European crisis. The building trade is st stagnant like everywhere. I know that also in America things are difficult, but here it is beyond description. Added to this, not as it is in America, every state here is autocratic, has no raw materials or consumer articles. The turnover is strangled through the horrible inflation, the prohibitions of export and import, closing of frontiers. An unimaginable railroad misery which you cannot fathom in your wildest imagination. For instance, three mixed trains, Switzerland, Vienna, during the week hardly function. This is so all over Europe, and if you multiply this situation by 10, you can picture yourself the catastrophe in Austria. Even so, one hopes that one can build. Better buildings for years to come will be barracks, as one hardly has seen them before in this land of culture. To see this come about, a legion of practically starved persons in the building branch look happily towards to this event. The idea of, quote, art has naturally disappeared from their horizon. Blessed are those who have a roof over their head. Blessed to live. There's nothing to see, there's nothing to learn, and especially not enough to earn a living. I have endlessly and frantically tried to find work without any success. Everything is frozen. I understand that in some moments you are tired of the United States, as most people get tired of unenduring situations which, which they know through and through. But that you contemplate to change with the situation here could only be done out of ignorance. Perhaps Europe is ahead of the United States in its tradition, in a finer and more developed class structure, practical estimation, conservation, treatment of all cultural values, a more spiritual, less hectic life, which was a result of a certain affluence. All of this has disappeared, is discredited, 
refuted. From this primeval filth, one can possibly see in 10 years the sprouting of new buds. Bread, money, the most dire necessities of making a living is all which occupies these impoverished souls. And bestiality is still the best in these surroundings of sweaty feet. One cannot get anything washed. Neurosis, desperation, insolent upstarts, sordid adoption. If only I could get to the United States, how I wish I could. If only to get together with you, but I believe it is impossible to get a visa and the trip is expensive. Could you give me advice? Could you help me? Could you send me some material for study? I believe, like you do, that the new objectives will come from America, but I believe in you particularly. Regarding Wright, I had the nebulous impression that he expands and elevates onto a higher plane the Dutch pertinent to the point outlook with the Anglo-Saxon world view. In some way, he must love the South, which I believe is in contrast to what the customary view is in USA. He adapts the Roman way of using plaster. The Anglo-Saxons are everywhere a foreign insert except in the temperate zones. Riots buildings from inside out give me the feeling that human beings originally had their homes in mild climatic regions, that the greatest, the most beautiful, and the most harmonious ones did not live facing a fireplace nor die in a bedchamber. His buildings combine marvelously all human greatness way above any comfort, so that a Buddha facing it would not look exotic and the teaching of the Bible would not remain a Sunday school exercise. Reflecting upon his level, wide-spanning, shade-giving roofs, the harmony of his informal floor plans, I see in him a renaissance of Southern spirit, only with a strange reservation that the Southerners hardly ever had harmonious dwellings. But they had a harmonious outlook and a genuine philosophical spirit and a deeper relationship to heaven and earth. I guess one notices that this southern outlook came to him from the temperate east where the sun is not a threat. How happy I would be if I could see his buildings. Surely they portray a kind of world citizenship like all true art. There is something higher than the American smile, American comfort or activity, I also notice that in the art of landscape architecture, we have to rise above our aims of creating only a pleasing environment. The Chinese of the Sung and Tang period created gardens that would help them, as would any landscape, to rise above themselves instead of only comfortably relaxing after a day's work. What has been felt recognized, experienced as important and significant, must have its constructed dwelling place, and comfort should be self-evident, unobtrusive, and not considered as an art objective. Could you not send me some learning material of how constructive details are developed in USA like roof trusses, windows, glazing, doors, furniture, ceilings, walls, stoves, I'm terribly frustrated here on account of the building inactivity. Sometimes I feel so downhearted by all this loss of time. It seems that in Europe certain changes are only for the worse. The bankruptcy of the mind equals the financial one." Unquote. Schindler's answer is unfortunately lost, but some of their 1921 correspondence was saved and will be quoted later on in my biography. Neuter spent a year in Zurich working as an apprentice in a tree nursery and also studying for a semester at the Technical University. He wrote to his future mother-in-law in January 1920, Dear Mutterly, I had a chance to study the customs, teaching habits, students of a foreign university and had a chance to study for one semester. I was able to surpass most of the students, although I had time only during the lunch hour and at night while I worked in the nursery and had also to spend time on commuting. 
I also received an excellent certificate from this university and an equally excellent recommendation letter from one of the oldest and most reputed nurseries of Europe. About his work, his first job as a draftsman, he wrote, and I quote, Finally, I had a chance to make a start in my profession and begin at the bottom. I am not a bloody beginner anymore. I am now somehow familiar with many office techniques. I have learned a lot of detail work, have participated in a large school competition and one of small housing units which my bosses won. All that is now behind me. I have learned to know how a very small office functions and how primitively one can help oneself if necessary. Surely another opportunity will arise. I have learned to work long hours and overcome deadness of soul and persevere. Although I was for five years a commanding officer, gave orders, sat on a horse day after day, it did not hurt me to be subordinate and sit well behaved on the drafting stool. Surely other circumstances will develop." Unquote. Finally, in the spring of 1920, he had to return to Vienna as his father was dying. There he tried to find some work as a draftsman, again without avail. So he worked for the American Friends Mission, a Quaker organization that tried to help the Viennese people. He made researches for them, drew propaganda signs, etc., and continued his efforts to get to USA. In April 1920, he wrote to his future mother-in-law, Dear Mutterly, my endeavors to get away from Vienna have today suffered again a setback. Thus, I must continue to bear it. Although whenever abroad, I have learned so much, and I know of so many places in the world where I could advance much, much quicker. Mutterly, I don't speak of earning money, nor about well-paid jobs where one advances with a blindfold over one's eyes to discover after 10 years that one has allowed one's innate capabilities to atrophy. A man to whom this happens has missed the boat and has nothing to give anymore. I need bosses that have character because then they recognize my worth or the promise in me. Bosses whose creative powers I can observe in order that, that, that this example toughens my character. I need different bosses, one after another, who can develop my various capabilities." Unquote. Or at another occasion, he writes down some thoughts about keeping a goal in sight. Quote, the smaller the means are to keep a great goal in sight, the more elastic becomes one's willpower to overcome the thousand setbacks one always again has to hurdle. I can never forget my goal because my whole being is constantly aware of it and new hope sprouts ever anew for the path that compels me with physical necessity. My capabilities are obligations that torment me when circumstances hinder them to bloom into activity. They are the beacons through every darkness and confusion, and one needs patience until the time is ripe." Unquote. Of course, the connecting text between the letters is telling the story of what happened to us. The next letter I want to read was written in 1921, a year after my mother and I had visited Neutra in Berlin, where he thought he had found a job only to lose it again. We had visited him for three days, and after he had brought us to the railway station, he described his feelings and his frustration. He wrote, I walked back, mounted the stairs, heavy-footed, entered my room, turned on the light, sat down, took off my coat, and went to bed. It was about 7.30 p.m. Is it your impression that grief is a good sleeping remedy? Perhaps so. But my mind started to mull around. Here I was without work, without a job, without an acquaintance, without a friend in this tremendous metropolis with no money or any prospects. Also winter was standing before the door, cold and sinister. When, oh when, shall I ever find a pursuit approximately near my inner path? All these thoughts crossed my mind. Here it was already three years after the war. In Albania and a thousand other godforsaken places, I had waited for four years for the war's ending, ill and powerless. 
While I was waiting, I had accomplished crazy tasks with youthful enthusiasm. I pulled the covers over my head and said to myself, at the moment your life is not endangered, but the human beings whom you treasure most have now left. True, I was alone, but no life danger. True, I also had a bed, and was not afoot since 48 hours with five cannons and 80 horses trying to warm my way upward in deepest darkness and pouring rain, while once the dawn broke, the sun shone, the enemy on the opposite ridge started to shell us. As one completely exhausted, I was indifferent to any danger. I gave my orders quietly, helped to pull the heavy howitzer while the weapon carrier lay already in the ditch. When I heard the whistling of the approaching bullets, I bellowed, cover, in order to show my people that I had not yet lost my mind. Of course, the wheel driver with his two horses could not jump behind a rock, and the poor critters put their heads together. A few detonations fell right in front of us. I shouted, pull, get going, because for heaven's sake, here we could not linger. We had not slept for 36 hours, had not a stitch of dry clothing on, and just now the damned so often men the shafts broke again. This happened on the mountain Blumina, 900 meters above Trebinitsa Gorge in Albania. But now I was lying in my own bed and come morning could walk up and down endless streets to look for work. Then came a very desperate period. I knew that I was not forsaken, but still 100,000 minutes were solitary ones. And at this stage of life, I'm ready to give and receive love." Unquote. He was then 32 years of age. His lucky break finally came with the employment as a city architect in the small Prussian town of Luckenwalde. He was chosen on account of his knowledge of plants and garden designs. He wrote to my mother, and now for the time being I have advanced from an unwanted foreigner to a civil bureaucrat in Brandenburg. Here in Luckenwalde, the community is building a lot and much of it has half completed. A railway station, hospital, three or four housing projects. I am supposed to develop a master plan for this city of 26,000 inhabitants, as well as a forest cemetery inside the city planning department. I am also supposed to give advice to the private building sector. On account of all this, I also wanted to get out of Berlin's unhealthy hubbub and out into the country. Mutterly, I wrote you intentionally for the time being all the good sides, as I perceive them now and why I came here, the bad sides I shall find out later and shall report on." Unquote. Now follows a most interesting correspondence of about eight months in which he describes all the ups and downs, political intrigues, etc. Unfortunately, time does not permit to read you this, but I want to quote at least a letter he wrote me describing why he gave up his employment in Luckenwalde in order to work with Erich Mendelssohn who was in the early 1920s the most interesting and controversial architect in Germany. Dear Dione, first, I had six weeks to give notice. This is a disadvantage possibly only for the employee because up to the last two weeks he is so unfree that practically uh, uh, no new boss wants to engage him. Usually one looks for someone who can start immediately. When I came here, I already had decided to remain only during the good season. During the subsequent developments, my resolution vacillated with the changing circumstances, and I started to develop a thick skin with regard to some obnoxious occurrences. I had to come to terms with a lot of humanly interesting problems, which I would like to describe to you in detail and with a great pleasure. Finally, my thoughts were these. Here you do not want to establish a permanent position because in any case it would be premature. To participate in the winter and leave during the good season when building activity picks up again would be foolish. A so-called incident seemed to offer a new winter employment in Berlin. No time to reflect, go. I also gave Mendelssohn no time for reflection. Everything happened in a jiffy, but not head over heels. He liked me so much that he threw his intention to hire a chief draftsman into the winds and took me instead, although he had advertised for one. I had nothing along to show him, but told him I had a concert ticket, was already late, tomorrow was the last possible day to give notice, he should engage me for three months, 
let me know immediately, and now tell me what streetcar to take to reach the concert hall speedily as the concert started at 8 p.m. He said, take the U, but otherwise what as it was at his wit's end. I said, Mr. Mendelssohn, please telephone me tomorrow, L82 or 142. I can give notice before noon. Goodbye. I flew down the stairs, jumped into a used streetcar that just came by, and missed only one song. The next morning, I had a long, quiet discussion with the planning director about the ongoing work. He left the room for a moment, fortunately, just then when Mendelssohn phoned because nobody in Luckenwalde was supposed to know that it was he who was hiring me away. Therefore, all Mendelssohn said was, I repeat my proposal. And I, very well, laid down the receiver, went to the director's office and gave my notice. He was simply bowled over and could not understand this sudden reversal of the situation. When he asked my reasons, I told him I had many. He immediately took a defensive position, whereupon I surprised him a second time by not attacking him, but giving quite different reasons. The whole inquisitive click here was nonplussed, could not make head or tail of my decision, and especially could not at all understand that I kept on working with such abandon and even doubled my efforts. To sum it up, all worrying forces here want to use my departure to reproach the others most eloquently. I evaded skillfully to be drawn into any of these squabbles and gave nobody the satisfaction or any ammunition for tittle-tattle or to speak depreciatingly about Luckenwalde. I try to keep free of all slander as far as this is possible here. Why do I want to tell you all this, my dear Dione? because all of this has some relevance to the task I'm leaving behind half finished. A few houses of my design will have to be completed after my departure, and nothing should be countermanded after I leave. But all of this takes a major backseat to the task of the forest cemetery. The forest cemetery is my child. And for seven months, I exerted all my effort and defended it against its enemies and their stupidity. When I decided to discontinue the work, I experienced a soul crisis that penetrated my very marrows. You simply have to imagine it. It was really terrible. I called myself contritely even a murderer. I had nearly as little time left as after a blooming conflagration. After a few days, I got over it and started the rescue. I had to completely win over all decisive personalities. I bicycled to the forester's home, drank coffee with his wife, and this older nice women took my side. In the evening, I visited a city gardener. I told him about my life and described my intentions in glowing colors. I pulled all the registers of my superiority, but at the same time put myself in amicably on an equal footing. He is a good fellow and hopefully knows his vocation as well as I believe he does. I gave him books about the newest ideas in gardening and caused that otherwise let others be purchased for him. He caught on. From day to day, I made him more enthusiastic and livelier. I ordered plans and saw to it that the letters ordering them were speedily expedited. I sped to Rataman and pulled the forester with me, telling him stories and buying his breakfast. There I bought plans on the spot and hurried their delivery. I advertised in the garden journal and bought plans all over Germany, carefully selecting them. I drew telling and suggestive plans that were supposed to speak long after I can speak no more plans and more plans. I suggested to the councilman to make a nursery only for the use of the forest cemetery in order to determine for 20 years to come the race of all plants in order to preserve the plant unity and prevent the mixing in of a foreign body. I got the funds from another source as the monies destined for the forest cemetery were already exhausted. I explained that if one buys young plants, grafts them, propagates them, they are at hand when needed. 
in the correct sizes for a minimum of cost at all times whenever the continuing planting schedule necessitates it in the desirable quality with the same exact orientation as one can find it in the tree nursery, thus also in the cemetery. My principal consideration, however, was to produce planting material in two weeks that would be useful in 20 years hence. I counted heavily on the growing interest of the city gardener whose significance through this task would grow and whose sole involvement would like to remain with a project that had decidedly started. I was able to persuade all those in power and ordered the plant material from three sources. I ordered fire insurance for the cemetery. I ordered the afforestation of the Bear South Zone in such a manner that the future layout was past and trees became visible. I ordered clearings for the next 10 years with the necessary and exact plant selections and meanwhile planted with a newly engaged workforce whatever new plants that had been ordered arrived. I was able to enthuse the city gardener ever more with gestures, glances and expressions by trying to paint for him like a magician what I envisioned would happen on that spot. I helped personally to plant, rake, dig, and bicycle continually to take care of the hundred other tasks. Dear Dione, if you could have listened to me, you would have understood that a forest cemetery can be as magnificent as wonderful music or a piece of art. A cemetery underneath the sky with a colorful and silver gray carpet of plants, its terraces, red berry bushes and junipers on its slopes, clearings, planted full with heather, and a symphony of a thousand...